welcome Mariah to Keys to Success. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So let's talk about where you're from. Mm -hmm. Okay, where am I from? Well, I guess I would say I am from California. Okay. <laughs> I was born in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up, I spent most of my early childhood in a small rural community, um, Coosa County, which is in Northern California. And um, then I moved to Sacramento for junior high and back to the Bay Area for high school and college. I went to grad school in LA and then moved back to Northern California after that. So California girl. Right, cool, cool. Um, let's talk about, cause I, I, I read in your bio, it said um, that you emancipated from foster care at the age of 17 and then ended up going to graduating from UC Berkeley with a major in, um, on, in, on media and cultural representation. What, what was your... You've done your research. <laughs> thank you. What was your mindset back then? Like, what were you thinking as a 17-year-old emancipating from foster care? First of all, you were in foster care, and then you decided to emancipate from foster care at the age of 17, and then go on to accomplish what you have. Do you, what, can you take us through your mindset, what you were thinking at that point in your life? <laughs> You're taking me back to the old school. Um, <laughs> you know, the first word that came to mind when you, you know, started that question was survival. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, um, if I go back to like my mindset, being that 17 year old emancipating, I had actually wanted to emancipate early. Um, I'd, I'd had several placements with my adult siblings, and God bless them, I so appreciate them for taking me in. Um, when I first went into the system, I went into a receiving home, and then I went into a foster home for like a week, and um, then I was placed with an adult sibling that I'd never met, mm. and I, I subsequently went on to live with two other um, adult siblings. So, you know... <clears throat> It's, it's awkward, you know, being placed in any family that you didn't, you know, grow up with, that you're not familiar with. Um, I'm thankful that there was that familial love there um, and that connection, that family bond that, you know, just wasn't established early, but there was just just different challenges in each placement, and there wasn't a lot of stability, especially in terms of, you know, the high school that I was in. Um, I was fortunate that, um, aside from transferring into Hayward High as a freshman, uh, mid year, and then having a stint at the end of my junior year where I had to like bounce around and find a school in Oakland. Um, that I was at Hayward High for most of my high school years, and so like that was really important in being able to get the classes I needed to be on track to get in and being able to get like the honors and AP placements. Although at the end of my junior year, I did lose a couple of my um AP class placements um, from you know um, not being able to continue at Hayward. At, for that year but um what I was really looking at then was just like I was going to school in Hayward and I was living in Oakland I was commuting a very long way plus I was working and so I wanted more stability and I wanted to be closer to school um I wanted to have more autonomy and just how I lived my life and um just the stress that I was exposed to because I had a lot of things going on um now emancipating was still stressful I had to petition the court and I can't even like, I've forgotten so much of, like, even with that, I just don't think about it that much. Mm -hmm. I was just focused on moving forward and just trying to make something of my life and um, having some stability in a future and a hope. So mm -hmm. um, that's just what I focused on. And, um, you know, I had some influences in my life that encouraged and inspired me and gave me some direction. And I just ran with every glimmer of hope and opportunity that was afforded to me. So that's where my mind was at wow. that time. Um, I just wanted to get into, you know, the best school that I could. And, you know, I kind of was raised in the generation of like, go to the best school you can and get the best job you can. And I had no idea of, you know, what I was going to be exposed to from then on. But that was my mindset at, at the time. Wow. That's, that's very, that's incredible and powerful because I, I'm just thinking like a lot of people that I would, that I know, I, cause I'm 28. And so I can, you know, it's not, I, as I think about it, a lot of people in that age range, they're not even thinking about anything that you were thinking about at 17 and you put it all together as far as, 
you know, I want this, this, and this. It seemed like you were so focused. Was that, um, was your situation went a driving factor in you kind of blocking everything out and being focused on what did you what you wanted for your future? Well, I think it was a couple of things. So I should say this. I'll just go back to freshman year. Okay, so, um, you know what, and I'll go back a little bit farther. When I was growing up in that rural community, it was very um, racist. Mm. <laughs> just put it like, say it like it is. You know, it was like, I was called everything but my name. You know, it was, it was not, it was very overt. You know, mm. I was definitely the minority. It's like my brother and I were the black kids. Wow. So, and we're mixed, right? So, um, I think my brother was an athlete, so he kind of had a crew that he fit in with. But um, with me, it was like I hung out with kind of like the outcasts, right? Mm. Um, and so a lot of my time was in introversion in the books, you know, and I think that afforded me just like a level of, you know, education, you know, I had a library in my home, I privileged in that way. Right. So, you know, and I, and I feel like I was, um, you know, I did well academically and I kind of fell off track just going through a lot of moving around and some traumas that I had in my life going into foster care, losing my brother at 17. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I went off track and it was like wrong other things, right? So by the time I was a freshman, I was at risk of literally flunking out of school. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and um, when I went into foster care, there was like an intervention in the receiving home and I had to go through like different tests and behavioral assessments. And, you know, I was kind of encouraged to do well academic and when I met my paternal family I wanted I wanted them to like me I wanted I didn't want to disappoint them and so I think that uh, so encouraged me to apply myself academically and I had um, one sister that was in college and one who exposed me to um, to the CSUS um, library system to do research on a, a writing project and I ended up winning an essay contest so I had those little wow. like encouragements and in that I meant earlier that um, it inspired me to focus on my education because again I was flunking out like I was cutting classes I mm -hmm. was hanging out I was smoking and drinking and doing all, all things so it's not like I was some you know perfect teen okay right. mm -hmm. um, I was at all the risks that other kids in foster care are at but I also did have um, I think a lot of kids that are in foster care that are brilliant and they don't know it mm -hmm. they've never you know been allowed to thrive in the way that I had been allowed to uh, in my, and they weren't afforded the same stability or, or interventions that I was afforded when I did reunite with my paternal family, even those through the foster care system. So I think it was those interventions um, in my freshman year, particularly, mm -hmm. that kind of set that course. And once I saw what it took to get into UC Berkeley, I remember I went on a on a uh, campus visit with a friend, and as soon as I set foot on campus, I knew that that was the school that I, I wanted to go to. And everything else just kind of confirmed that for me mm -hmm. and researching, you know, the university and the other alternatives. Um, and I just remember, like, interacting with the students and seeing, like, oh, they're cool. They like me. Like, they do the things I do. They like the things I like. Oh, yeah. here's the arcade. And here's, you know, what it's like to hang out at the house and, you know, with college students. And so just, I think, having those exposures, mm -hmm. um, not only in the formal, like, tour of the school, but, like, I toured with the homie. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and I saw that she lived in Berkeley, and she exposed me to the students that, that I could relate to. And so I think that having that kind of gave me, um, you know, a goal. And mm -hmm. once I set my mind up at that goal and saw, like, I just reverse engineered, like, like, what do I need to get there? So at the time, as, like, a freshman, I was really behind because I was working out. So I had to, like, stay in at lunchtime and, and talk to my teachers, like, okay, I'm not getting on how to do this trigonometry thing. Like, can you teach me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Right. And they saw my initiative and um, that impressed them. So, like, I had teachers that advised against me for sure. Like, I had this teacher, um, by the time I was in my senior year, I had gotten into um, AP statistics. Mm -hmm. And that was by virtue of um, literally going to junior college classes in the summer, getting concurrent enrollment forms wow. and going to junior college in the summer and taking classes. And math was my weakness, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, but because I did that, I was able to accelerate my track and, you know, get on track for, mm -hmm. for UC Berkeley or for the UC system. And so anyway, I had this statistics teacher and she was my first period class. Now, mind you, by that time I was emancipated. So I was living on my own. I was working seven days a week. 
So I go to school and I get out like at 3 p.m. and I would go to work and I would work, you know, three, four hours. And then I would come home and try to do as much homework as I could. If I didn't finish my homework, then I would do my homework in the morning. Mm. And so sometimes I would skip her class or I would be late to her class because it was my first period class. And I would also be tired. You know, I was, I was tired. Right. I was tired. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. Um, and, and mind you, I had my fun too. So don't, it's not like I wasn't out, you know, doing my thing or whatever as a teenager. I had fun too. But um, I would be late to her class sometimes just trying to get my work done. And so she thought I was a slacker. Mm-hmm. But she ran into my um, history teacher in the student lounge, and somehow or another, he told her that I was emancipated. And so all the stereotypes she had about me went out the window. And the yeah. next time she saw me, she was like, oh, my God, Mariah, Mr. Dwyer told me that you were emancipated. And are you okay? It looks like you've lost weight. Are you hungry? Do you need anything? <laughs> and her whole attitude towards me changed. And she ended up being, like, one of my ambassadors and helping wow. me uh, with transitioning into UC Berkeley. So it's not like... You know, I didn't experience bias or whatever, but, um, you know, I think just reaching out to teachers and being um, kind of humble or vulnerable enough to ask for help um, and, like, finding some people in my classes that could tutor me, um, that that helped me, you know, to just augment my weaknesses. And, um, you know, it, it helped kind of being a new girl, too, because I had some people trying to book me I almost got jumped one time wow. <laughs> you know? so so it's like okay well I'm just gonna be in the cuts doing my thing <laughs> and focusing on my future mm-hmm. and um I was kind of like that was just my path that was my way out of my situation wow wow that's that's incredible so you go from foster care to emancipating at 17 to graduating from UC Berkeley What's next? Yep. Um, so I went from UC Berkeley to uh, straight to grad school at USC for motion picture producing. And um, that was kind of, by then, I had caught the entrepreneurial bug. I had started my first company around 2001 um, while I was at Berkeley. I, I started a boutique production company. Um, and I kind of arrived at that through a couple of other influences. So again, like if I was going to say anything as a takeaway to anybody listening to this, I would say be like, you know, partially intentional and partially just open to serendipity of who you connect with in life because that has been all the difference in my world. Like mm. all of it, everything in mm. my world that's of any, like anything amazing about my life is by virtue of the people who are in it. I, whether it's my daughter, my husband, my coworkers, my peers, it's always the people in my life that make my life wonderful and amazing. Mm. So um, there was two people. One was like a Ghanaian. One was my husband, like my now husband. Um, he came here on scholarship from Botswana, um, which is a, a country in southern Africa. It's right above South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, a very you know prosperous, um, peaceful country. And he came here on scholarship for filmmaking. And my family was very much involved in the arts, but I, I hadn't really been interested in like movies or anything like that until I met him and he kind of inspired me at the time I was like really into social justice and you know power to the people and (laughs) you know like marching in the streets before Facebook and Twitter or like you know um, like the prison industrial complex and all that so he um, had you know like inspired me to use the use film as a medium of empowerment Mm. and uh, you know like giving a, a a Given a vitamin with the pain pill, so to speak, and that's a place where people of color, and since we're, you know, the California Black Chamber of Commerce here talking, um, you know, people of color have um, been opened, have been invited and welcomed into entertainment. We have been allowed to entertain people as minstrels, as comedians, as performers, but what we have not had is ownership of our cultural product, and we have um, been subject to problems. Yeah, and that you know our cultural um, product is portrayed to the world in terms of like buffoonery um, and you know to justify our oppressions, so to speak. So I followed Napster in the tech industry, and I felt like that same disruption was going to hit in the film industry because at that time we were learning um, fiber optics to have the kind of bandwidth we have now. I'm dating myself, but um, that that was what was going on. We were converting to the uh, uh, adoption of digital media mm-hmm. 
on the like exhibitor leaders and also on the filmmaking side. So you think like Matrix era, like if you know that movie and how right. groundbreaking it was, that was the era that I was in. Um, so my husband, my now husband, had kind of inspired me to look at film in an entrepreneurial perspective. And I had a friend from Ghana, so a lot of African <laughs> for a dynamic going on here. And I think there's things to that, and right. especially in the age of uh, you know the post Black Panther, um, the movie era, I think there's something to that. Uh, yeah. um, but this friend from Ghana was studying to be a stockbroker. Books that some stockbrokers had had given to him, and among them were uh, Robert, uh, was it uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow. And that was the first time like I knew that there were businesses out there in the world that created jobs, but I never thought of you know, being a business owner or, or an entrepreneur as a job. But after I read that book. I saw it as a means of economic empowerment um, and economic development um, with a, a end of social justice. So that's when I started really getting interested in entrepreneurship and I decided to like focus it in on the entertainment industry. So I went straight from UC Berkeley into USC and I transferred to UCLA and both of those um, both of those schools I studied motion picture producing, which is the business side of filmmaking. Wow. And so you served on um, some entertainment-oriented organizations, Film Independent, the Film Arts Foundation, the Image Awards, Pan-African Film Festival. Um, did you ever, when you got into that, did you see yourself being a part of that, or how did that come about? Wow, you are really on it. You know more about me than I know about myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you say that I see myself being, are you asking did I see myself being a part of that industry? Yeah, like when you be, when you first entered into the the entertainment industry, did you say okay I'm here, um, now I'm gonna shoot for this, or did it just happen like you said ser- serendipitously? Did that just it just all start um, coming to you? That that's a great question. I was very intentional at that point about like wanting to get into the entertainment industry and get in at the highest level that I could. So I think my life. My life has, like, my life decisions have kind of been like this. Where can I have the most impact? Mm. Based on the information that I have, where can I use my life, my privilege to have Mm. the most impact? And I think part of that is because I'm an empath. I feel things. I feel people. You know, like, I think as a people, we're we're more empathetic than most. Like, in in USC, the term that they would use to describe black people was soulful. Oh, oh, that was soulful. I kept on hearing people say, oh, yes, it was. And, yeah, this, this picture is very soulful. And I started realizing okay soulful is basically hollywood code for black (laughs) so you know we soulful right like we tend to feel like when we say you feel me you know it's like we tend to be more feeling and i am just like it's true like i'm an empath and like when things are just harmonious in the world and people are suffering like i feel it like i'm not happy people are suffering so i'm not the kind of person it's like I gotta, I gotta be all that, have the best this and that and whatever. I'm not gonna be happy if my neighbor is suffering. Like I'm gonna be like, okay, how can I lift you up too? So that's just my mindset, and I know I'm rare. I'm like the INFJ is like one percent of the population, mm. but like MLK, Mother Teresa, that is my pathology. Wow. So wow. my mindset was like, okay, these people have had this impact on my life, and this is how it felt to me. This is what it did for me. And then I had a couple of, of little micro experiences where. I had impact on others, and that was like, damn, excuse my language, but yeah. that's my drug of choice. Like, that gave me so much joy to be able to a young woman who was apathetic and discouraged and feeling like her school wasn't teaching her anything and being able to have like a real heart-to-heart conversation and encourage her and run into her three months later and have her hug me and tell me, I didn't know I could go to college while I was in high school, and now I'm in a program at CSUS. Right. You know, like, seeing her change from being Apathetic to hopeful, or seeing like you know, just communities come together, or see a young man whose main ambition was to be a shot caller in his in his Compton gang, um, call me and tell me and my husband that after this twelve week art therapy program he was in, that now he wants to um, now he's enrolled in college. You know, wow. like those were the things that just like they did. Like I said, that was my drug of choice. So my decision making has always been like, where can I use my life to have the most impact? So I was intentional in wanting to go to USC and get into the motion picture industry so I could see like the who's who, the creme de la creme, the top of the line of the motion picture industry. And I've always looked at like, how high can I go to open doors for others? And I can't say that those doors have always just like 
open for me. I've had doors slammed in my face. I've been mm-hmm. humiliated. I've been rejected. I've suffered it all. But, you know, I've learned so much and gained so much. Um, and so, like, yeah, I went into the motion picture industry not so much like I want to be, like, a director or the top producer in Hollywood. It was more like, how can I empower filmmakers? How can I empower um, not only my people, but all people to better understand each other through the stories we tell because stories have been shown to build empathy. Mm -hmm. So that was like my intention there. And then I also saw the economic aspect because motion pictures um, are such a huge export of the US um, economy and such a huge part of how we're perceived around the world. It's part of our soft power. Um, And so I definitely saw economic opportunity and cultural influence um, as something that I, I could, you know, understand better uh, by virtue of being in that world. Wow. So you're doing all this and then you found time to get a professional designation in financial planning and securities. <laughs> 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 How did that come? What, what made you like, where did you find time to do that? And, and what, what was that specifically? Um, yeah, good question. Wow. So, I'll be honest, the way that that came about, um, you know, you, you might think it was like time to my friend, was it like trying training to be a stock or something like that, but actually the way that came about was um, I was privileged in that, like I mentioned earlier that I'm, that I'm mixed, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, my mother was actually disabled and that's part of how I ended up in foster care, but um, her mother, um, you know, cancer survivor, survived cancer five times, but um, she was like the matriarch of the family. Eighth grade education, you know, West Virginia white woman, mm. came across country with my grandfather who fought in World War II and settled in Climate Falls, Oregon. I had my mom, only child. And she left me a trust. Um, and that, it was an education trust. As I said, she had eighth grade education and her main ambition for me was to see me go to college. And mm. I went to college on my own you know, just on the dead, you know, worked my way through. Um, but when she passed away, she left a trust that enabled me to do my first year of grad school without having to work. Uh, um, so I did that. Mm-hmm. I um, honored her wishes in that regard. But then my second year of grad school, <laughs> I had to figure it out. So um, I was working full time at the Capital Group. I was camping. And, you know, I did a couple. I worked at the film, um, the film Independent. Um, on, a, on a year I had off while I was transferring over to UCLA. But while I was at UCLA, um, I was working at the Capital Group, which, you know, was also in the financial industry. But I saw, like, an ad in the paper, you know, about uh, jobs in the financial industry, and I could get started right away, um, originating loans and trained to get into um, financial planning, essentially, and get my securities licenses. So did that in much the way that I started my boutique production company as an undergrad because I was working 20 and 30 hours while going to school and starting my production company allowed me to be able to do like some commercials or videos or you know small projects where I could I could work a fraction of the time that I had to work you know my my freshman and sophomore and part of my junior year um by like just doing these these gigs Mm -hmm. and that freed me up to be able to take on the internships and apply to the you know um, to take the GRE and apply to grad school. So, like, once I got to LA, I, I really couldn't compete with a production company in that ecosystem. But, um, you know, I got into the financial industry so that, like, if I closed a loan or two, I wouldn't have to work the 40 hours that I was working at the Capital Group. Mm. So, wow. that's, um, that's <laughs> how I ended up getting into, into work from 7 to 4 and then go to class from six to ten and have you know a two-hour you know commute per day like to and from school you know fortunately my my now husband would like he would drive me so that i could do my homework in the car i blew out many fuses plugging my laptop in uh to the little adapter but um you know I, I wanted to have more time to get to dedicate to my education and to pay my way through school so that's that's how i got into the financial industry Wow. Which I quickly exited out of because if you look at the timeline there, uh, 2008 happened um, just a couple years after I got my 
my uh, licenses. And so I had actually exited. I saw the writing on the wall, meeting with families and just seeing, it, you know, it didn't take a big short. If you've seen the movie, the big short, it didn't take a spreadsheet for me to figure out what was going on with people being upside down and, you know, all the little dynamics that are another discussion for another day. Um, I saw what was happening and I, I didn't have the network of like high net worth, um, you know, people in, in, in my circle to sustain me through that economic crisis. So by 2007, I exited and I started uh, actually teaching for the Art Institute in Sacramento. Wow. Okay. And um, at, so are you still currently involved in venture capital or no? Yeah, no, so, like, that was totally separate from venture capital. I didn't, like, I I kind of knew what venture capital was because, you know, going back to undergrad at UC Berkeley and the Napster era, you know, that was the dot-com boom and bust, you know, like, so I saw all of that happening, and I knew that there was, like, venture capital involved there, but, um, and I was, like, actually pretty technical at the time. I wasn't doing any, um, I wasn't doing a tech startup, as I mentioned, I had a boutique firm. But, you know, film in and of itself is, is pretty technical. You have to learn, you know, different software. And, you know, I was um, yeah, I was an early adopter of a lot of the early SaaS companies that software as a service. Um, and I had learned, like, HTML, you know, CSS wasn't yet at that time. But I had started learning to code. I had built, like, new websites and e-commerce. It was, like, way before its time. Like, mm-hmm. trying to sell movies online and wow. stuff like that. Um, so I had already kind of been involved in tech. But when I was in the financial industry, like um, as a FINRA licensed professional, that was more like, you know, consulting families and small businesses on, on the financial planning, which is totally different from venture capital where you're like, you know, raising capital and deploying it in companies and, and whatnot. So that was a, a whole other, um, I knew that I wanted to be involved in that, even with the, in the film industry, when I said I wanted to be able to empower filmmakers, part of the reason why I went into the producing program was to, you know, um, like I already knew that I wanted to produce. I wanted to have a you know production company, or even um, even beyond that, I wanted to have film funds that I could deploy into filmmakers. So mm-hmm. um, that's kind of like you know fast forward into uh, like around 2012 when I started getting back into the film industry, and I think it was around 2014 I started getting back into tech. Um, that's really when I started um, exploring capital and I and that was really through taking some classes with the Kaufman Fellows Academy and it was like right after my mom had passed away it's like 2013 and the Jobs Act had come out in 2012 they were still you know making all the rules and if you don't know what the Jobs Act is it's under Obama administration mm-hmm. it basically was game changing and what it did was um, like before the Jobs Act if you learn the securities and exchange commission rules the blue sky rules they're all interrelated but um, those are securities laws right and so I had to be tested on security law. So I was kind of familiar with that. So when the Jobs Act came out, um, actually, when I was when I was in the financial industry, one of the things that wow, makers are raising money illegally, left and right. <laughs> you know, these, so I knew that when I went into financial planning, I was like, oh wow, this is really relevant to my industry because filmmakers don't know that they're breaking law when they're raising money. A lot of them, not all of them. Mm. Um, and back then, after Enron and everything, it was really hard to get like securities attorneys. Um, people were risk adverse. So fast forward, you know, um, job act based changed it. When you're raising money, it used to be you could only raise money from your professional network. So if you didn't already have a professional relationship with someone, you couldn't raise money. So what does that mean? Mm-hmm. That means if you poll and you ain't got rich people in your network, right. you raise the norm, that's <laughs> what it meant. Right. So you're dependent on like, serendipitously making some connection going back to that whole network thing right mm-hmm. um you know who you're connected to who you, you interact with you know you're basically you have to you have to hustle your into your network to find somebody who's a money person right, right. um so the jobs that changed that that it opened it up to where you didn't have to only raise money from your own personal network and part of that was in what's called um the general solicitation provision so now under the job you can actually raise money. You can advertise your venture on TV, on the radio, on the billboard, any kind of way. But you can only raise money from accredited investors. And what does that mean? Accredited investors are people who make individually two hundred thousand dollars a year or more, or as a couple three hundred thousand a year or some more three hundred thousand a year or more, and have made that for the past two years, or they have a net worth of over a million dollars, excluding their primary 
temporary residents as a laws that were enacted around the 80s, around 1985 or so. So, you know, I was paying attention to these laws and why is this important? And especially in the context of us as the people and people who be socioeconomically disadvantaged, when you look at when these laws were written and came out, these are, we're talking about the Investment Act and uh, the, yeah, I forget time, but there's a couple of securities laws that basically came out like in the 30s and, and 40s. I think one is 1944, one is 1930. So this is post, you know, stock um, market crash. And this is an era where, you know, we're um, uh, post reconstruction, you know, black communities are building, pe- communities of color are building, we're still under segregation. You see the black Wall Streets, right? You've, you've got a, a, a movement of black Wall Streets being destroyed across, across the country. Um, and so I think that the, part of those laws, when you really research them, on to contain the economic power of communities by restricting who could invest in different ventures. That's my interpretation of the laws. So then that you know, um, changed that in a way, but it didn't go really far enough. And it also opened up crowdfunding. So I got back into tech by virtue of this Hoffman Society and um, trying to seize on the changes that the Jobs Act had opened up and applying those to, you know, my own startup, which is um, in the, the, the motion picture space. So I started this company, CineShares, which is still active now. Um, and the, the, the whole purpose was really to um, democratize access to capital for entertainment related companies and for filmmakers and to leverage the, the new laws that came out of that. So while I was going through these um, this, this program, the Coffin Fellows Academy, taking online classes to basically validate my, my dream, my idea, um, I met some people and uh, one in particular, Rusty Dornan, she kind of took a liking to me, saw my activity in the, in the program and encouraged me you know, after some conversation where I told her, look, I'm really interested in economic development. I'm really interested in venture capital at large. I see Senate shares as venture capital for the entertainment industry, but, you know, I'm interested in, you know, larger economic imp- um, empowerment through venture capital. And she said, you should really apply to the Coffee Fellows Society, which is like next, next generation. It's a book program of um, entrepreneur friend capitalists. And so I did so. It was like applying to grad school, the whole like letters of recommendation, transcripts, interviews, like the whole shebang whole bunch of like questions and essays and I was accepted as a finalist and basically what that did was it opened me up to a network of um capitalists that I developed relationships with and that's how I evolved with the founder institute which I went through as a founder with my company CineShares I was a female founder fellow um I ended up graduating from that program and only 30 percent of participants a little bit more than that now um tend to graduate from that program um and you know, now I launch the Sacramento chapter where I work with um, early stage founders in accelerating their company. So I got into venture capital in that way. Um, it was, you know, certainly the, the financial industry experience I had before influenced that journey um, as part of that journey. But yeah, that, that's something that I'm active in now. And I'm actually like, um, I know we had discussed this previously, but right now what I'm doing, I'm, I'm on a bit of a hiatus. I'm, still doing that but i'm uh, currently in the policy hub and so um they're you know tech experts learn the policy process and we produce policy output for this 10-week program so i've just um honed in one of the um, we we all work on two projects and so in in this next six weeks um i'll be working on a project to help um to help uh it was called power to people one of them um, and that's to help like help under Representative population be more active in the civic um, process, the um, in policy actually policy making process, and then the other project is about closing the early stage funding gap. And so, yes, I am still very active in venture capital space now. Wow, uh, that's very interesting because I don't know if you know, but the California Black Chamber of Commerce is uh, very active in legislation and policy. So um, maybe maybe there would be a way that we can partner on that. Uh, that's a question that, I, some questions I have to ask after the interview, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, yes, I would love to, to discuss further. Uh, even, you know, beyond the job, um, certain like parameters, you know, we don't do any lobbying, we're nonpartisan. And, you know, so we, we did our whole ethics class. And I think I does good through ethics class. And then I have a better idea of what projects I was gonna work on and what we could do. Discussed today, 
I'm really I'm pleased with the uh, um, with the like unconventional. I don't normally get to talk about the things that you asked about today, so I'm actually pleased in the, in the with that. But uh, um, yeah, I'd be happy to discuss not only what we're in this from, but now that I am being enlightened and informed and empowered as to policy, what can be done in the future beyond the program. Perfect, perfect. So a question that I have for you, is it difficult to be um, a woman in the, in the venture capital, capitalist field? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, yes. <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you explain some of the, some of the uh, pitfalls or maybe roadblocks that, in, that are involved? I'll say this. I think there's the, on the one hand, there's being a woman in venture capital, right? Mm. And on the other hand, there's being a black person in venture capital, mm. right? And then there's the intersectionality of being, being a black woman in venture capital. And if you want to really layer it on, you know, being a multi ethnic woman in venture capital, <laughs> like, is probably a thing. Um, so, and then also, you know, like, being a black American woman, mm. um, as opposed to say like an African woman, mm. um, which you know, if you look at you know oh, the people who are in, who are involved um, in tech, black people who are involved in tech, I would say that Africans um, over index in terms of black representation in, in tech um, compared to like African Americans, and there's different dynamics at play with that. There, I'm sure, um, can be just explored, and we, we touched on the, the diaspora earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think, like, you know, just the obvious things. You know, we, we've seen the Me Too movement come out over the past couple of years and uh, some validation of that women have been experiencing. We've seen, you know, like, with the, um, this current administration, um, you know, dynamic, um, validated the fact that we're not all still issues, you know, um, and I think technology has, um, um, have to them out because the lens that used to be used to population aren't so easy to pull anymore when we have platforms that can amplify messages. And so a lot of dynamics at play that I think we've seen. So being a woman of color, you know, I think this is a great time to um, to blaze trails, so to speak. But, mm-hmm. you know, when you look at things like, I, I like to cite um, Richard Kirby, because um, I, think, I think his company is Equal Ventures. He's a venture capitalist. So he spun out from... Um, uh, where was he before? Uh, it'll come to me. But anyway, he did a report called "Who Is a VC," and he followed that up with "Where did you go to school?" And um, that basically broke down the data of like the gender and ethnic dynamics of venture capitalists. And, and, and "Where did you go to school?" basically shows that forty percent of venture capitalists come out of Stanford um, or Harvard. I did try to get in Stanford, so did not get in. <laughs> <laughs> But like, that is the mafia of the West Coast and Harvard on the East Coast of venture capital. And then there's like a handful of other schools that are, you know, um, the over index. Um, and most venture capitalists are, you know, not operators. They're not engineers. Um, so like the main way that people get into venture capital is by virtue of network. So, mm. you know, as a woman and a person of color, you're less likely to be exposed or accepted or, you know, just otherwise in those networks. So, like, there's not, it's not like there's not, you know, exceptions and there's not like, uh, ML, I think it's MLT4, M- I forget the name of the program, but there's basically a couple of programs that track um, people of color into MBA programs and, you know, some VCs are tapping into associates out of those um, programs and that's wonderful, but those kind of become like the source of talent of color, right? Like, and then other people don't have equitable opportunity. And um, it's kind of the same, like we had a speaker come into the Aspen Tech Policy Hub last week from um, Code 2040, and she was talking about like the same dynamic of like, you know, tech companies that, okay, well, we're gonna source our, you know, talent of color from this program, and it kind of became like an elitist source. And so like, you have like these certain tracks that will get you in by virtue of network. And so I think like, when it comes to being a woman or a person of color, like there's less than 1% of venture capitalists are black women. Like mm. that that's the current statistic um, from Richard Kirby's report. And then you look at like Project Diane from Catherine Finney, um, 
and she was like the first person to really do this on black women in, in tech entrepreneurship. And when she came out with that report, which I think was in 2016, there were 13 black women who had raised over a million dollars. Mm. In capital. Now that number has gone up. I don't know. It's probably over 40, 50, 60 now. I don't know. But at that time, that's what it was. And this is before Joelle Burke. Uh, maybe she had just sold her company to Amazon. Um, uh, people like Stephanie, Lamp- uh, Stephanie Lampkin, um, uh, Macy, uh, oh, I forget her, her last name. Oh, but she's um, the, the CEO of On Second Thought. Like all of these dynamic, amazing black women are out here. They're qualified. They're doing all the things. They're checking the boxes and they're not getting funding. You know, I, I talked to the first um, institutional investor in, in, into Joel Burke's company, um, Parpick, which, again, sold to Amazon. Um, and she said, we tracked her for three years. She's winning all of these pitch competitions. She was at TechCrunch, but she wasn't getting funded. So these are like, this is a function of bias, right? It's not like a function of not being qualified, mm-hmm. you know. And so, like, going back, there are people in venture capital, like I think of the Marlon Nichols. I think of, you know, um, Mercedes Benz. It just became, I think, the first... Um, first um, black partner to get at, at Greylock. I might be misquoting, so I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. But um, definitely, like, Mercedes checks all of the boxes, right? Like, and she's amazing and, you know, like, more power to her. Then you have, like, outliers like uh, Arlen Hamilton, who, like, was very transparent about being um, temporarily homeless and, you know, like, living out of the airport while she was raising her first $5 million fund. And wow. she doesn't have, like, a college education, but she just hustled her way into the field. And I think that, that those are, like, inspirations that show us like what can be and we look at like going back to you know black women in, in in entrepreneurship we look at like the number of black women who have had successful exits compared to their numbers being funded i mean like if, if you just look at those statistics like you should only invest in black women <laughs> you know we are gonna like you know look at the ratio of exits to like funding um then it, it would be like only invest in black women so like there's definitely um bias at play that is causing inequitable, you know, access to capital, um, inequitable opportunity. And so in that sense, yeah, it's difficult. But I think what's exciting is that we do get to blaze those trails. We do get to keep that stores. We do get to build the coalitions. We do get to, you know, um, create a better, you know, more equitable and just society, which is part of what the Aspen Institute does and why I'm here and why, why I'm um, working to shape policy. So, you know, it's definitely challenging, but it's also what in- inspires me and wakes me up in the morning. It's like part of the impact that I want to have, have in the world. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, this next question is kind of vague because you're you're involved in a lot of different business fields. But I guess I can just ask you, what is the what is your outlook on the most important trend in any of the business fields that you're in? Well, I will say something that I'm super passionate about. Like, you know, going back to the previous question moment early, I walk in a room, people see a moment, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and they just assume, oh, you're, you know, and especially they hear diversity ventures and some people get get double or triple under this and that. Um, But, you know, most people think, oh, you're about women and people of color. And like, yeah, I'm all about women and people of color. I love women. (laughs) I love people of color, but I love everybody. Right. And I think one of the fields that affects us all, like I don't think I know, like one of the, the areas of technology that affects us all is clean tech. And so um, that, that's an area that you um, really blend and I'd like to see more venture capitalists get active in. Um, there's another team here in the um, in the tech policy on um, clean tech adoption. And we'll see how that, although I'm not going to tell their story, but um, you know, what has been discouraging, not discouraging, but like disappointing, I would say, like I've been a, a, a tech, on the tech advisory committee for Calci, which is a $24 million fund that um, the funds are aging companies uh, in Cal- that, that benefit California ratepayers in the energy sector. And, um, you know, we've had a couple of amazing exits even out of like just being around for three years. and. You know, it's disappointing that more venture capitalists have not taken an interest in this area that impacts the whole friggin' planet. Like, if we can't get uh, our, if we can't get global warming, can't get change under control, you know, like, who cares about the next, you know, photo app or the next 
you know, food delivery app. Right. Not to disparage those founders or what they do. I appreciate, you know, Postmates as much as anybody else or DoorDash as much as anybody else. Um, but like, we need clean air. We need, um, you know, like to not have our cities flooded and, you know, to have mass refugee crisis because of um, climate change displacement. Um, so in that regard, as it pertains to, you know, your, your constituents and demographic, I would say I would love to see more people of color involved in that movement. And, you know, there are people of color that are hidden figures in the movement. And they're going to be like, you know, this is a, this is Black History Month when we, you know, tell all of the, you know, Black inventors who are known and whatnot. And I blast those out every year. But, you know, there's so many people that are in um, technology that are hidden figures. And there's some that are in clean tech, but there's there's not enough. And um, climate change and clean tech impacts our communities. Um, more so than others. Um, it disproportionately affects rural communities and low income communities. And so, um, you know, it's an area where we definitely need to be at the table and have a voice. So I'll say that that is major. Um, next to that, I would probably say FinTech um, and just like banking the unbanked and like, you know, just leveling the, the playing field and, and um, you know, creating more pathways to economic empowerment. Um, you know, where, where policy comes into play, I'm very much interested in changing those dynamics around um, accredited investor status and, you know, um, looking at like, you know, how can we have a bipartisan, you know, like, you know, discussion on, um, you know, creating pathways to allow people who are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged to um, participate um, in the startup ecosystem more equitably beyond what the limit beyond the limitations that are that are um you know that are that, that are involved in crowdfunding right now which is like the next which is the only possible realm for non-accredited investors to invest in early stage tech companies so those are some of the things that i'm super interested in and passionate about um in the field that i'm in mm -hmm.